So now that we have a good basic introduction and understanding of what prokaryotes are, where they're found, and how they're so pervasive and dominant all around us, it's time to delve in a little bit further. We're going to now start looking at the actual structures that compose a prokaryotic cell. And first and foremost, we're going to be looking at the outside of a prokaryotic cell. And that outside can be termed the cell surface, and that's what we'll be looking at in this first flowchart. So we'll call this next flowchart cell surface structure. So of course these are going to be structures on the outside of a prokaryotic cell, uh, Roman numeral one. There are going to be, I think, two or three parts for this. And uh, first and foremost, we're going to focus on an important part of a prokaryote, a critically important part for your understanding in terms of their relevance to us, and that would be the cell wall. The cell wall plays an incredibly complex and incredibly important role in how prokaryotes do what they do. Now, when we look at the cell wall, we're going to first uh, split this up into two different videos. So this will be actually part one of the cell wall because there's so much to cover. And part one will be focused exclusively on the functions, the direct functions of the cell wall within what? Within prokaryotic cells. So what does the cell wall do? Well, first and foremost, let's remember that we as eukaryotic cells, do we have a cell wall? No, we do not have a cell wall. We simply have a cell membrane, a plasma membrane. Prokaryotic cells have a cell wall. They have a cell wall because they're one cell usually, unicellular, and so that one cell, it makes sense to protect that cell as much as you possibly can, and so why not use a cell wall for a great form of protection? So as a unicellular microorganism, you're going to be facing extreme crazy environments. The possibility of death is endless, so might as well protect your inner self, your cell membrane and everything associated within your cytoplasm with a nice strong cell wall. Now, speaking of strength, because this cell wall is strong, we're going to state that the cell wall functions very well in the maintenance of shape. So we'll call this the fact that the cell wall maintains the shape of the cell. And again, when we talk about the shape of the cell, what cell are we referring to? We're referring to a general prokaryotic cell, mainly for the most part a bacteria. Now, in order to discuss shape, we actually can classify bacteria based off of their shape, and that's how we actually name bacteria as well. What do I mean by this? Well, if we look at three basic shapes that bacteria have because of their cell wall, we get the following. We get the cosi shape or the caucus shape, depends on if you're singular or plural. This is plural. Um, this is going to be our cosi, which is usually going to be referring to the idea of having a ball or sphere-shaped sh bacteria. So, typical example of this would be something that is a, a diplococcus. So this is a two-sphered bacteria, let's say, and that's why we have the diplo part here, so we can write that down in quotes, uh, quotes two. Diplococcus would mean it has two spheres that consists uh, that are sort of combined next to each other to give us a unicellular organism that is a uh, caucus. It is a ball or a sphere. There's also a streptococcus version of this. You might have heard of the streptococcus version. This is uh, important in our own understanding of uh, many different diseases. And strepto would just refer to, in this situation, a chain. So this would be a chain. Instead of just having one or two balls or spheres, this is a chain of balls and spheres. Um, and that's going to be our streptococcus. Again, caucus referring to balls and spheres. Finally, last one in terms of the cosi group is going to be the staphylococcus. This is another one you might have heard of. Um, it's also involved in transmission to humans. And this is going to be our staphylococcus. And in this route, what we're going to be looking at is the fact that these usually show up as clumps. So they are clump, uh, the clump bacteria, uh, clump of balls and spheres in terms of its shape and cell structure, all due to the cell wall, of course. So this is our cosi. We also have bacilli bacteria. So we have cosi bacteria, uh, and then we have bacilli bacteria. And in terms of terminology, you would say you have a caucus bacterium if you're talking about one bacteria that is of a caucus shape. And if you're talking about several, you're saying cosi bacteria that have a cosi shape. So it's several. Uh, this is the plural form of it. Same thing over here. This is bacillus, which would be the singular. Bacilli is our plural form. This simply means that uh, this bacteria possesses a rod-like shape. Rods are going to consist 
are going to make up the shape of this bacteria. So this is a bacillus bacterium or bacilli bacteria in terms of the plural versus singular. Finally, last shape to understand are the spiral bacteria. Okay, And the spirals are again based off of the cell wall structure that we see. And the spirals are going to be broken down further into either the spirillium class of bacteria. So this is the spirillium class, which just would refer to understand that the spirillium class would be bacteria that are quite rigid in their structure. So remember, rigid for spirillium. And then also the last one, which would be spirochete. Spiro, there's that spiral root right here, spiral root right here. And then the difference here now is the keat at the ending. This would just mean not rigid, but the opposite, actually. This would actually mean bacteria that possess quite a flexible cell wall. Now, all of these are good in their own environments and in their own ways, in their own adaptive evolutionary qualities, and we don't need to get into those details just yet. The last two things we really need to understand about cell wall are crucial in our understanding of why bacteria are good at what they do. Bacteria have this cell wall not only for protection, but something for more, spe more specific than protection, and that would be prevention. This is going to be simply put as the following. The cell wall functions as a preventive mechanism, and it prevents a certain event from happening. It prevents the cell, again, the prokaryotic cell, the bacteria in question, from bursting. It prevents the cell from bursting, and that bursting is only going to happen if this cell is put in a hypo, hypotonic environment. So if we have a bacteria cell, and a bacteria cell is put in a bunch of water, why is the bacterial cell not going to explode? Why is it not going to just want to throw all of its contents into the water and turn this hypotonic water full of um, a solvent known as water and turn it into something more hypertonic? Why won't it explode itself and it release all of its contents? That's because it's prevented from doing so, releasing those contents because the cell wall prevents this hypotonic explosion, this bursting, so long as it's a hypotonic environment. Now, there's a bit of a caveat here. Though it prevents cell from bursting in a hypotonic environment, it does not, and this is important to write down here, it does not, does absolutely not, the cell wall does not prevent a separate process known as plasmolysis. It does not prevent plasmolysis, plasmolysis in hypertonic environment. Hyper, hyper more solute in this environment, lots of solute in this environment, very little solute in this environment. Remember from Bio 1, you can't just forget Bio 1. So, does not prevent plasmolysis in a hypertonic environment. Look at this word, plasmolysis. We know lysis means to split open or to break apart or to just split. And this is talking about the plasma, the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane will split open if it is stuck within a hypertonic environment. A best, the best way to understand both of these ideas is to absolutely, I suggest, looking at figure 7.12. It will certainly give you a much better visual understanding of this idea of hypertonic versus hypotonic and the idea of plasmolysis that does occur. It does not, the cell wall does not prevent plasmolysis, whereas the fact that the bursting in a hypotonic environment is prevented by the cell wall. Very, very important distinction between these. Look at figure 7.12 you'll get a much better understanding of this. And that covers our initial understanding of the functions of the cell wall.